Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, okay, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, our speaker today will be Gonzalo Lopez, uh, but first I'm going to ask Adam Kemp to uh, introduce himself and explain the the the, the context of the lab, the, the which is now called the Sainsbury. What's it, the Sainsbury? You'll explain the oh. name of the lab and everything, and the move to London and the sort of connections you'd like to build with Microsoft Research. Well, first, thanks to Don, and thanks for you guys for coming. Um, how this happened was. Well, we've recently been uh, tasked with moving our, our research group to this new center called the Sainsbury Welcome Center. Um, it's part of UCL. I don't know if anyone's heard of this before, but it's a, a research institute for systems neuroscience that uh, is a relatively undefined area of neuroscience between stuff we do understand at the level of neurons to stuff that we we'd lots to talk about at the level of psychology. It's essentially everything in between, which means it could be anything. Um, this realization, and even in discussions over lunch, is that we have a lot of work to do in terms of designing conceptual frameworks for how we interpret uh, neural data. We find this very fun, but I think a lot of people working in many different fields, including here at Microsoft Research, as I've discovered over lunch, have a, are just as welcome to be part of this conversation. So I think at the beginning of Gonzalo's talk, I just wanted to say my name is... Adam Kampf, we're starting, a, I think, a very fun research group in London, and you should all feel more than welcome to pester us, because we will continue to pester you for ideas about how to go forward, which is what I did a couple weeks ago pestering Don, and this is why Gonzalo is here. So thank you, and stay in touch. Is a university research group? It's a privately funded new department of UCL, specifically focused, so how that works, I think, is ideally the best of both worlds and not the worst of both. Uh, we can independently do what we want, but at the same time borrow from UCL's infrastructure. Um, so it's the Lord Sainsbury and the Wellcome Trust have decided the brain should be understood better than it currently is. What exactly they do, they've left up to us. Gonzalo will give you a flavor today about how we approach this problem. To put it into a broader context for me, we are specifically, my lab is um, previously called the Intelligent Systems Lab, and we we are trying to figure out how cortex works, which is a the piece of the brain which got very large in humans and apparently is uh, quite relevant for intelligence. And in order to do that, one thing we realized in the context of the many centuries of neuroscience um, investigating what different parts of the brains do, if they used uh, behavioral assays, ex in, like in experimental environments in which you can control the sensory inputs an animal gets, measure its behavioral outputs, and look at what's going on in the brain in between. And to do this, they built environments that were very well controlled, where the sensory inputs were restricted and the possible behavioral expression as well, because that's all they could keep track of. They needed to have this control, otherwise they couldn't interpret the signals they saw. It turns out cortex is not required to do any of those behavioral experiments, which has been this awkward dilemma that we've realized over the last uh, decade or so, that the paradigms we use in neuroscience actually don't require the part of the brain we most want to understand. Hence the desire for starting a lab in which we're going to need better tools for building more complex paradigms that actually do require this part of the brain that we'd like to figure out. And that's really where you hire uh, people with computer science training and you task them with make it easy for neuroscientists to build much more complex interactions between inputs and outputs to de define experimental situations that require neocortex. And that's where... Gonzalo got started, and I think he's done an amazing job with this. In fact, he'll discuss much more about the use cases, particularly in neuroscience, and I think towards the end, he or I will be happy to answer questions about the specific research we do. But I think it's worthwhile now spending some time just talking about this framework, which has totally changed the lab, the way we do research in the lab, as well as this whole institute now is actually moving towards a bonsai-based form of the behavioral experiment. So without further ado, Thanks again to Don, you guys, and it's up. Thanks. I can turn this. I think so. So, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, good. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's actually a real pleasure to be here because I guess, in the sense, uh, this story is, uh, grows quite further back in time. And um, in a weird way, uh, all the technologies you guys have been developing here at Microsoft Research and um, 
Microsoft elsewhere have quite, quite a quite deep embedding in uh, what I'm going to talk about. So there's two parts to, to, to this. So there's the, um, what I'm going to tell you about is essentially how we've um, pushed these technologies um, to do the kinds of um, assays that Adam was describing that we want to do that require handling these complex data streams and kind of controlling them as well. And then there's a particular history to put this into perspective, because I could tell you what bonsai is for. is essentially a tool for the rapid prototyping of systems uh, that handle um, data streams. Um, but that can be many things. So to give you a perspective on what I really mean, I will go through, I, will, I want to show you a small video of the kind of stuff I was doing before I joined um, Adam's lab. And so let me show you that video. Second. So. so starting in starting in the late um, mid to late two thousands, uh, I was in this company called Y Dreams, and they wanted essentially to build um, build and explore natural interfaces for humans interacting with computers, other than using the mouse and keyboard, essentially. And they wanted to have this touchless, natural interface um, with these digital systems. And I somehow ended up in this research group where we were exploring uh, two different fundamental ways to do this that I'm going to share with you. So essentially, one of them is these um, physics-based simulations where you have uh, virtual elements and you sem that are running in a simulation, and somehow you, find, you get humans inside that simulation in a physically um, meaningful way. Um, so all these little elements, there are actually can be particle systems, they can be um, whatever you want, and the, the humans themselves are also um, elements. Yeah. But if you realize here, they're all just um, we're still working pretty much on the image plane. So it's uh, all like a 2D kind of simulation, physics based, the human is inside. But we were also interested in another paradigm that is very popular now, the augmented reality, where you take a virtual world and you register it in 3D with the real world. And this is just an example of how we were also exploring these kinds of systems. Maybe you can't see very well. That is a storybook for children. And this is just a, a, a playground at human scale of um, essentially uh, virtual avatars interacting with humans. And at some point we realized we could kind of bring these two together and build um, 3D registered physical based interactions. Uh, this is now using um, a 3D depth camera. This is actually the Canesta, which is now Connect2, I guess. Um, so we were playing with this back in 2010, building these systems. And once we realized the power of this, um, we really exploded and started doing these experiments apply to many different scenarios. Um, so this is now, it also per pervaded into our side projects. This is a, like a dance performance where particle systems kind of follow the dancer around, and have different behaviors. This is still the same, the exact same principles. Another dance performance. You said the exact same principle. The principle is the same principle, and actually the same framework. So it turns out that in this company, I was also developing a framework for. Um, so the principle and the framework. The principle and the framework are exactly the same. It's, the, the idea is you have these physical elements that somehow are influenced by the human uh, in a unified simulation. That's the that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to ask questions. By the way, that's that's great. That's great. Here, the dancer is kind of controlling the direction the flight was going. And this was turned out to be so general that we actually managed to control um, robotic systems with this. So this is now, again, the same principle, but we realized we could, if we can register a simulation with the real world, we can actually use that simulation itself as a mental model for a robot, where now the decisions that, in this case, is a swarm of ro robots that we built, are based upon um, happenings of 
that are going on in the simulation that is, again, the same exact idea. Um, <coughs> this is just, yeah, robots. This is in a, a bank um, where a team of robots can kind of serve as your virtual guide. Um, yeah. And then, of course, you can explode this. This is a, an interaction with an audience. Um, it got, it to, got them to play Pong, which is just more, again, back to the simple idea, but it's kind of finding ways to scale it up to real, many different scenarios. Yeah. And then now what this has uh, turned into as, I, as I've moved into this uh, behavioral neuroscience uh, scenario that Adam was talking about is this can actually bleed through uh, the way we build environments for uh, animals, where we want to m move away from the more restricted uh, scenario of, of an animal passively being presented with stimuli to um, building an actual environment that works in an in a, in a ethologically meaningful way. So that turns out that also requires uh, an environment that is intuitive for the animal um, to be in. Yeah. So here the animal has to collect these uh, spots of light in, in order to get a, a, a reward. OK, so that's kind of the trajectory. And this is really what, what motivates. So this is, these are the kinds of systems that I wanted to make easy uh, to make. And um, it turns out this is very useful for, um, for neuroscience as well. And this is kind of like um, just a, a panoply of uh, different, um, different experimental setups people have built uh, with the framework that I'm going to show. Um, show you, tell you about uh, today. So it goes, um, essentially used primarily, I guess, still to follow animals uh, in real time as they move through their environments, uh, but in many, in many cases also to control the kind of stimulus that um, you present to this animal or even to synchronize the, that recording of behavior with some measure of the activity of the animal's brain in some case. Um, but I think the best way now at this point to really get you into this is to, to tell you about how, what, what this thing really is. Um, so I think that's where I jump a bit into demo mode. I'll just show you. So I was, I was showing you that video already in, in the bonsai framework. So this is, this is what the framework looks like. It's um, the user interface. It's Windows, it's Windows Forms. It's great. <laughs> but it's basically, um, it works the following way. So you have, I'll pull up the um, welcome screen again. And essentially, this is organized around the idea of um, sources of data, essentially data streams that you want access to. And really, the first problem that um, neuroscientists who are not familiar with programming really face is they want to interface with some device in order to get the data that is somehow produced by it. And this can be very complicated. I mean, if you ever, ever programmed the uh, code to initialize and, and kind of configure a camera to just pull the images out. It can be complicated, especially if you not, don't have an engineering background, but you just want those camera frames, or you just want the data coming out of this amplifier, or a microphone, or whatever. Um, but then, once you have, so that's the first problem, and these are essentially what the data sources, here colored in violet, are gonna be represented. So this firm, framework is based on, a, it's a visual programming paradigm essentially. And um, so we have these data sources, as I was saying, and then you want to do something with these data sources. So you have a lot of these um, transformation nodes that allow you to kind of transform this data. But then what became most powerful is that, okay, there are many, um, it's easy to think of a data processing um, system as just a pipeline of, of data coming through. But really what happens in neuroscience very quickly once the experiments get complicated is that you're dealing with a lot of heterogeneous devices. So the, the, the devices are not synchronized in any way and um, they're working independently. They are made by different vendors, by different, uh, there are different systems. And you, but you still want to somehow combine their data together. And um, so the idea here, this is where the, the idea of, of, of merging this with, uh, that we had to kind of solve this problem at the asynchronous level Came, came up. And when I was thinking about this is really when I, when I um, bumped into the, the reactive extensions that was just uh, coming out. 
And I kind of modeled the, the, the problem around uh, that. So I'll, I'll tell you outright that everything you're seeing here is essentially based on the, on the reactive extension. So these data sources, I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with Rx, just curious, okay. Should be, I'm just kind of assuming everyone is, but in a, at least in a, in a, in a way. No, 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 no. But I, I'm, I'm kind of assuming, do you know about it? Or should I, should I, not, not much at all, but do you, so the, um, do you know about um, essentially Link? Is Link like a familiar, the, the language integrated query language into the, that's okay. Yeah, so it's essentially the, the only thing that um, the reactive extensions have done is essentially turn what were essentially database queries into queries over data streams. So it's like you have a database where you, usually in the database you passively pull data um, from the database and you kind of process it. And the reactive extensions, you, you get data thrown out at you. Um, and it turns out this was a very convenient place for me to start expressing this, this language. Um, and it's basically what you're doing as, you're gonna, as we're, we're going to be building these pipelines is that we'll be building a query in Rx. And, and I mean this in a quite literal sense, meaning that uh, when I, so now I'm going to build a couple of uh, workflows with you. So there are plenty of such tools, right? like Simulink, which lets you draw data flow diagrams. Exactly. So, so do you, you, you obviously looked at those and chose not to use them. So many, many you know? of them, they, they turns out, they still don't work. The asynchronicity of these data streams are still not a primary um, citizen in this framework. So they mostly work on, because it, they do have a synchronous and parallel programming, but the, the way you wire up this logic is still very much um, as a synchronous flow of steps. And uh, what, what they do then, like for example, we have LabVIEW and Simulink, yes. The way they, they operate is the, the way they introduce parallelism is you, you draw out a flow like of, of processing that you want to do. And then they're going to analyze syntactically the, the, the flow you've made. And then they, they recognize point, they automatically infer for you points of parallelism and you'll parallelize your processing that way. But then, but it's not something that you as a, as the, um, the user of the language, you're not controlling at a fine level that parallelism. At least in all, on most, most uh, for, on all the ones that I've dealt with so far, I've, I've never seen it uh, used, used that way. Okay. Yeah. Um, but you, if, <laughs> happy to get feedback. Um, okay, but I think it's easier to just show how this feels like. And there are more, more stuff that will become hopefully obvious as we move along. So essentially what I, did, what I did here when I was showing you the video was add one of these source nodes. In this case, it's a file capture um, that essentially provides you um, a data stream into a file, into a movie file in this case. Um, and once, once I play, so this node, once I start playing, the, the workflow essentially will make all the work of opening up the file and serving those frames that are in the file um, as an output. And you can, so this is, this window that shows up is essentially a visualization into that flow. And one theme that will come out uh, as we will start playing with this data stream is you can kind of visualize everything that is going on in the workflow, which is something that is very convenient if you're rapidly prototyping these systems, is you want to be able to have like a complicated pipeline you've just created and essentially now inspect each of the steps while it's, uh, while it's running. So let's add one of these steps to kind of um, get a feel of what, it, what this is about. So now I've added a source and now I will add a transformation uh, to the source. And the first thing I want to do is essentially just restrict. You may have noticed when the video, there's these dark bands here. Just want to get rid of that. So I want to process the central part of the video. So I'll just add a crop node. So now I'm going to crop the image. And here on the right hand side, there's properties you can, you can use to kind of parameterize the behavior of the node. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up the crop node. So I'm visualizing the data that is coming out for the crop. Uh, right now it's not doing much, but I will essentially use the properties to define the region in the, in the image that I care about. In this case, it's going to be this region. So now the crop 
is essentially showing up that region only. And now let's add in more stuff. So let's say, let's try and extract some information out of, the, out of this data stream. And one thing that is very salient here is just uh, the shirt of this guy is very red. So let's try and pull that out. So this is a possible piece of information we might be interested in is where that shirt is in space. And one way you might do that is you, okay, let's come up with, let's say you split, we split the color. So this is a color, a stream of color images, RGB. And if you just split, um, so the split node that I just added is essentially gonna take all those input, input frames and give me now as an output uh, all the color channels that I can pick here. So one, one thing, um, that is important, actually, I, for, I forgot to, to explain this to you, it's, it's important. Each of these data streams has an output type. Um, because if you're, if you're, let's say, if you're accessing a camera or a file, you're gonna get images. If you're accessing a microphone, it's now in a different kind of format. Uh, or if you're accessing your mouse or your keyboard, as we'll see later, um, these are all different data types. And if you right click on these nodes, these output tells you what the, the type is. Um, so now I'm essentially I'm gonna get, so these are all just um, a blue, green, and red channels. So I'm gonna take that red channel, and if I play it now, so this is now the red channel of the image. Actually, let's pull out all of the channels. It's the red, the green, and the blue. And again, stop me at any point if I'm not being clear. So these are all, this is the green, blue, okay. So it turns out that an easy way to kind of pull out that red shirt is essentially to subtract the red, um, subtract the green channel from the red channel. It's any one possible way, there's many. So the way I'm gonna do that is now I have these two data streams, the red and the green stream, and you have to somehow bring them together. And there's operators that allow you to kind of merge um, these um, streams together, and they're essentially all the reactive operators. So I'm gonna use one that may, some of you may be familiar with, which is zip. I'm essentially gonna zip this data stream with this data stream. And I get a tuple of the two, of the two pieces of information in there. And now that I have this tuple, I can just subtract one from the other, and essentially now, I have that kind of have a, a more signal to noise um, a representation of that red shirt. What happens if you left it as the tuple but not subtracted it? Can you visualize that? Yeah, you can visualize. So it turns out it's uh, there's not an image visualization of uh, of that yet. And this is something that I I will come back to this later. Is all the system is extensible? So I'm showing you. I, I didn't go into extensibility yet but all of the components that you're seeing here are quite extensible. So you can not only build your own data sources, your own transformations, but you can also build your own visualizations. And you can pick from different visualizations. For example, here, I'm showing this image um, as an image visualizer, but I can also show it as text. So this is that, that image, just a, a text representation of what that is. You can switch to an image representation. Um, yeah, but you could do other stuff with this, or whatever you wanted. Um, so now let's complete just our extraction. So I'm gonna now threshold, just use a simple threshold to uh, really pull out, make a category boundary on what that shirt is. So you can also manipulate the parameters online, just kind of see the effect. That's somewhat decent. Yeah, it's good. And now, what we need to do now is essentially define objects from the image, uh, because we, what in the end we want is the location of the of the center of the red shirt, for example. So I'm going to use there's um, all the image processing operations that I'm using here are based on a computer uh, vision library called OpenCV. That some of you may also know, um, and essentially I'm going to scan the image for regions of connected components in the, 
that are essentially I'll show you. So the difference now is that what this, what this operator has done is essentially take the black and white representation of the image and built up a list of objects that are the connected patches of white pixels. And then I've, I've computed their statistical uh, properties in terms of the center of mass, the major and minor axis, uh, area, and so on. It's a representation of that. And once we have that, we can... Now, just let's say we want the largest object, because that's essentially what we were after. It's the most significant object inside the, there. It's a shirt. So it turns out another feature is a bit, uh, it can be useful sometimes, is you, wanna, you, may, you may want to see some of, these, some of these outputs in context of some other outputs. So when, one feature we've added in is the ability to stack visualization. So I can stack that visualization on top of this one and kind of represent the, what, I'm, what I'm doing in, a, in the context of the original um, data. Um, you can also extend that, of course. I mean, it's the, we call them mashups. Um, and then, yeah, okay, so once I have that, I can pull up the center of mass and add that to my stack of visualizations and now have kind of a trace of where the person is and, of course, I can graph that. Um, so here, the, the point of this is it, the goal of the framework is not so much on, I mean, People who are doing computer vision, this is like basics of the basics, like computer vision 101. But the point here to emphasize is how we wanted to make this easy for people to essentially just get these uh, basic things up and running because it turns out experimental neuroscientists can already do, do a lot of the, with this if they have access to it. Um, okay, so that's for um, control. Any questions so far before I move into the... So this is kind of what I was showing here is um, essentially data sources. We can add more. So for example, I could, I could just as well replace all the pipeline I was processing here. I could replace this with a camera. I have here a couple of them. We could presumably now use you and well, I guess we're tracking red objects, so it's kind of biased, but, uh, but you get the idea. I mean, the, the idea is it should be easy to exchange your source of data. Um, and there's many more of these operators that you can play with. And now we're gonna move, uh, next time we're gonna move to having effects. We want these operators to have effects on the real world. But if, if before that there's any questions, I'm happy to, to address them. Is it clear? Yeah. No? Okay. It's fine. All right. So let's say now we wanted to have not just process these data streams, but actually control them. And for that, I'm going to, I brought here a little setup that we're going to try and make work. Let's see how well it works. It's essentially an Arduino that you can kind of mount camera on and maybe you can't see it very well so I'll set up the second camera okay let's see if I can get a good view of this maybe this is enough let's try all right okay so now I'm going to set up um, essentially two things So one important thing of the, all of this being asynchronous you can, is you can naturally um, introduce parallel data streams here. So now I've just simply set up two, two data sources. Um, they're unconnected to each other, so they're just running in parallel. So one of them should be, should be the view of the camera. Let's try this one. Yeah, so that's the view 
for a little setup. Yeah. And just make sure that yeah, it's picking up both cameras. Try. Yeah. So this is the view from this camera. And I'm gonna put the view from another camera. Apparently, it doesn't like that. All right. Let's skip to one and then let's skip to this one then. Um, and now, what I'm going to set up here is essentially I want to move, I'll be able to move these servos in a way that will create some rules that are interesting. But first, just to check if this is all working. I'm going to set up here another data source, so the mouse. I've added a mouse source that essentially gives me, um, as I move my mouse on the screen, the coordinates of the mouse. And I'm basically going to pull up the x, those x and y coordinates, and use them to drive um, another kind of node, which we call a sync. So a sync is now essentially a side effect um, that is going to be caused by the computations on the data stream. Um, and the side effect can essentially be your data going anywhere to produce, to have some kind of useful effect. It can go to a file on your hard drive. You can save video. You can save data, which is what most scientists care about. But also, you can have uh, other external effects via devices. And one of them is the Arduino. So I'm going to be able to uh, we'll essentially say, send these two outputs to the servo. These are essentially the... So I'm essentially going to be How familiar are you with the Arduino? Also is another question I should ask. But this is essentially cheap microcontrollers that are very become very popular um, to allow people to just simply um, control some basic electronic devices. And um, the idea here is you can expose to bonsai essentially the, um, the layout of the pins in the Arduino, and you can set the state of each of, of these electronic devices by sending commands to the microcontroller. And one of these commands that you, you can um, expose essentially the um, controlling um, is PWM um, clocks that are running in the, in the Arduino and that kind of define a protocol for the servo to work. And if you do that, then if this works. So I'm essentially now um, moving my mouse and kind of controlling yeah, the pan and tilt of this camera, which is OK. OK, so at least the servos are working fine. And let's try now to do a challenge. For that, I really wanted to get these two running. Let me unplug one camera. Maybe it's. Exchange ports. OK, so that's one camera. And that's another camera. One, two, right, cool. Just switching USB ports works. It's good. Um, all right, so I have two cameras working. Good. So now what I want to do uh, is I want to use, I want to track this object over here, this little ball, uh, and basically instruct the servos to keep the ball stable in the center of the of the image. So the idea to to do that is essentially, actually, which one is which? This one, this one, all right. So for that, we're going to use um, something similar to the, to the first principle I was um, showing you before of segmenting color, but now in a slightly more sophisticated way. And basically, so the images from the camera come in this uh, RGB color space. Um, and it turn, but it turns out you can do a more robust segmentation of color if you work in a different space 
which is hue saturation value. Uh, I don't want to go into the details of how, how this um, transformation works right now, but it's essentially a different way to represent color where you can isolate the hue uh, and the saturation of the color. You can isolate that from changes in brightness. So it just makes it more robust. Um, and then you can threshold on that, on that representation, which is what I'm going to do now. So this is representation in HSV space. And this will be my threshold. Uh, and I'm just going to find here where the ball is really quickly. It's good. Now I want this to be a saturated object. That's good, good enough. So that's my object. So now once I, again, once I have my black and white image, I can again detect the objects exactly as, was, as I was doing before. Um, and isolate where that, um, yeah, where the ball is in the image. Right. Okay. So now the idea is um, to simply use that to drive the servo. And the algorithm is quite simple, but I'll use it as an opportunity to illustrate another, the first layer of extensibility of. Um, of bonsai is you can script directly in the language. And this is turns out as you're coding up your own situation often comes up uh, because the power of this is that there's a lot of operation operators already built in, but you you kind of want to do your own stuff. Uh, so one simple sim the simplest way to do that is to just um, work within a layer of scripting we've, we've, we've added uh, through Python which actually, because all of this runs within the .NET framework, uh, is actually Iron Python. Uh, and you can essentially, um, yeah, just define a single function that will dictate how the value that's coming in gets processed into a, an output. And what we're going to do here is essentially pick up our value, which is a position, uh, actually, I need to do that to make sure that this works. Is I need to, from here, I want to take the largest component, and I want to take the center of mass and the x position. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to first take care of the x uh, position, stabilize that, and then we'll stabilize the y. So now I'm going to add um, a transform that now is going to work on this floating point value, this center of mass of the object in the image and it's going to turn that into a servo command. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to compute an error term. It's just a basic negative feedback idea. And we're just going to subtract. Uh, we want to keep, we essentially want the error to be 0 when the object is at the center. So this is a VGA image. It goes from 640 to 480. Uh, so we want to keep the object in the middle of the image. So we want if the, if the position of the point in x is 320, the middle, we want the error to be 0, so no, no command. If it deviates one, one way or the other, then we want it to, be, to do something. Uh, so now we take that. So now there's a difficulty, because these, these servos actually don't work with relative commands. You can't tell them to just move left and right. You have to tell them to go to a specific position. So the, I have to do here a translation step. Which, he, which is I have to define a target, which is essentially where the servo is. And I essentially need to update that target. This is a global variable. I'm just going to set it up here. Uh, and essentially update the target with the error. And I'm going to normalize. So the, um, this is just a normalization factor uh, to account for the fact that um, we're working in image coordinates, in pixels. But I want to work in degrees, which is the, the, the units that the servo understands. So this is just a scaling factor for, um, let's start with a small, small step size. This doesn't blow up. So the idea is really I'm just computing an error and updating my, des updating my desired position based on that error. So we can actually visualize that before we do anything to the servo. So that's the position of the servo in X, of the ball in X. 
And that's actually maybe I should show, sorry, before we go there, let me show you just the error. So the idea is now if I move the ball, I'll basically control. So the, the ball is moving, but so is the error signal. So and if the ball is in the middle, then the error is close to zero. If it's to the, to the right, then the error is going to be positive, and to the left, it's going to be negative. And the, com the command is basically going to reflect that. So now if I just send the target based on that to the servo. So, so you guys can see what's going on. It produce a better arrangement. Yeah. So essentially, it's a physical image stabilizer. It is just, yeah, just using negative feedback. But now it can't look up and down. So only the x. So now to solve for x should be similarly easy. We basically just take, instead of taking the x, we can branch the output of this node and pick the y coordinate. And essentially, we want the same node, so I can just copy paste from this script to here. And now the image in y is different, so that's 240 is now the center. 240. And uh, now let's see if this works, because I forget the sign. I think there's a sign flip here, but we'll, we'll discover that. Uh, because the y coordinates is inverted, like, but let's let's find that out. Yeah, and maybe you're right. Yeah, it's running away. I think I also forgot to change the pin. Nice, nice loop. Uh, no, didn't like that. Ah, because it didn't find any object. We could add a check here, so that um, if no objects are detected, it should. Take care of that, but I think. Oops. Yeah, maybe we should add a check. So let's add a check here. The problem that is is going on is uh, when no object is detected, then the position is not a number. So let's just add a check to make sure that this doesn't happen. So I'm gonna define a check by basically picking picking the area of the object, which if no object is detected, the area of the largest object is zero. And just check if that is greater than zero. Then what I can do once I have this Boolean check, I can create a condition. So this is another type of node I didn't talk about yet, but this is essentially is essentially a where clause in a query. It's basically a filter for the for the data stream. So now when an output is coming here, it will be filtered by this condition. So only outputs that actually match the condition will be allowed to go through. So now we shouldn't, we shouldn't get any more of these NAN thingies. And now it's kind of picking up something. Let me just look at the ball. Yeah. I think, I think it's kind of running away from the ball. So I'm going to shift the, I think there's a, the sign is flipped, I believe. We can flip. Does it have time to edit? Yeah, let me reset it first to so I won't update the target. This should be easy. Um, so now I'll just reset it to the stable position. Okay, that's zero. That's good. Okay, now the object is clearly there. So let's try it like that.
don't know if you can see it from here actually. Maybe I should increase this guy, sorry. So you can see better what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a simple control system. Hmm? People have been building control systems like this for quite a while, but your your so what's your kind of unique piece here? The unique the, piece is integrating. The, your end users are, uh, are programming this, and they've never been able to do that before, perhaps. It's the it's the way in which technology is. It's the way in which you're given access to the technology. Is the the fact that I can just to gain access to a camera, I can just type camera, and images are being spit out immediately, instantaneously. Uh -huh. And the fact that if I want to do things in parallel, I'll just add more of these pipelines. And um, it's more about the agility of building this. People have been building control systems, but maybe not in 10 minutes. Uh, it's, the, it's, it's really because here the, the point is to be able to make this fast. Because as an experimentalist, there's a lot of value in being able in an afternoon to go for a bunch of different solutions. Whereas if I have to take a month to really try something out, yeah. then there's a, there's a big commitment. And people are kind of afraid. presumably as agilely as possible for a long time. I think it's, it's quite remarkable that nobody's tried to do this well, before. Well, the, the synchro no, no, they, they have. They, they have. I mean, there's lots of languages, even visual languages, that allow you to specify these kinds of pipelines. Right. But yeah. to use them and, and to actually bring this point across, maybe this is not the best way to do it, but to put the asynchronous of these data streams in forefront and not just uh, the... Um, that, that's something that it's, it's much, much rarer. I, I have never seen so in a place here where we can see the asynchronous of the system is at the forefront? Sorry? Is there a place where we can see that the asynchronicity is at the forefront here? Yeah, yeah I can. It kind of looks like to me like, well, here's a, a good data flow diagram. It makes perfect logical sense. Yeah. It works in real time. It's very smooth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can show you an example. Like, uh, we use this for parties as well. So I can maybe pull up th that example. So. Uh, an example that shows what's unique about yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me show you. Let me show you that. So let's now. This is something that I just an example that I personally like. So I'm going to take this camera that is now again not. Ah, sorry. I can't really put two notes. Let's take this camera over here and add a threshold operation. So I didn't. And actually, I'll use I'll use this opportunity to uh, to introduce another concept. So this is just a, a thresholded version of of this uh, of this image. But now what I want to do is I want to, so you've seen that these nodes have properties here that you can kind of manipulate on the user interface online. But one, and one other thing you can do is you can actually externalize them into their own elements in the workflow. And you can write to them using other streams. So now let's pull up data from the microphone. Uh, so that's now microphone data. This is presumably me speaking. And I'm just going to build a basic um, volumeter. It's essentially just a rectified version of this. And let's just scale that to something that, so if we, this usually isn't good enough. Let's see what the range of values is. So this is now just a basic volumeter, which makes some sense, I guess. So. Let's feed that into there. So if this works, shouldn't, yeah. How is the camera is working? Threshold is not. So oh, I get the idea. So the sound, yeah. the, the louder you speak, the threshold changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another thing. Did, did I illustrate the asynchronous thing that you were saying was the important thing? Sorry? You, you said that something about that the key thing here that is different to other systems is that you're exposing the asynchronicity. Yes. Uh, does, does this new example show that? No, uh, yeah, well, it can, it can, we can go over the, it, it does show in a sense because the updates to the threshold are asynchronous to the video stream, right? So I'm, I'm updating the, 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 the threshold. It's a very simple one, I, I grant you that. But it is, it is an asynchronous update of the, of the parameter. A more interesting example 
that maybe you'll appreciate or not is um, let's another thing that I that I like is one interesting issue that I'll give an example that people people use quite a lot is when you're analyzing let's say behavior or uh, just some data stream sometimes you have events that are triggers into whatever data you are um, pumping out and you what you want to do is essentially to take a, a snippet of that data at the moment that the event happened and you may want to save like a, a, a little window of data on aligned on that event essentially for example and the event itself may be asynchronous to what you're uh, doing so one way to do that and this is I don't think we'll have time maybe to explore this in too much detail uh, but one interesting way to work here is to slice essentially the data stream into little, these little windows based on some events. So what I'm going to use here is an operator. This is a triggered window where essentially I'm going to use a key down event. So I'm going to take a keyboard and essentially pick a key and use that key. So now what's going to happen here is you take the data stream and whenever the key is pressed, then you're going to slice that data stream into a window. Okay, and now you have, and each window is essentially going to be also a sequence of data that is going to last until the next key press is going to happen. So now you have all these chunks. Now with these chunks, you can essentially do whatever processing uh, you want. And essentially, the way we specify that um, is essentially through these nested nodes. So I didn't talk about nesting yet, but you can group computations into inner nodes. And in this case, uh, what I'm doing is this select many node is essentially taking the, each of the windows that I've sliced. And for each window, I'm going to do a computation. So it's like, it's like this workflow is going to run for each of these windows. And let's say um, I, want to, I want to save the video clip um, with that. So let's say, let's put it on. Can even be here. Fine. Let's create a videos clip dot avi. Um, let's add a suffix so file count. Okay. So essentially, what's going to happen? And let me bring you to that folder just so you see. So it becomes clear. Um, Yes, that is aligned that with the with the event of key press. Yeah. It starts the event of key press. Yeah, you would see all these wow. these things. Yeah, and you could. I mean, and then you have all. I mean, the, all the other examples would would use. Um, yeah, so the the other examples would use would make uh, use of all. You could use all of the reactive operators as well to build more complicated scenarios. But the the idea here is um, how you ex how, what we're trying to do here is essentially. Um, create a graphical language or kind of express these kind of complicated things in a compact way that people would, that are, do not like spend a lot of time uh, understanding these technologies could somehow uh, into it add. And I mean, I tried it to do use here like simple examples, but you could, yeah. Yeah, yeah any more questions? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, we can, we can play that one for sure. So let me just, uh, the movies, the videos, let's say if I just play it. So now essentially, yeah, whenever I hit a key, then a new clip is gonna start. And uh, maybe I can even point it here so that, I don't even know if this is the video frame. Yeah, this is the one. So that's the key I'm pressing, okay? So now whenever I press the A key, times okay so now if I stop that at least these last few clips the first frame should be me hitting the key it's blurry that's the key press event essentially it should be the same for all the other ones so they all should start at key press essentially yeah so uh, I'll, I'll ask as we wind up here, just ask, so all of, when you draw one of these things, there presumably is a direct correlation to a piece of C-sharp code using the reactive extension. Exactly. Set 
exactly. Out yeah. Like if I can show one more example, I could, I could just show you how you build one of these things, yeah. which is really quick. It's like yeah, two so, minutes. So it's, yeah, philosophically, it's like, it, it's a visual editor for reactive programming expression. Exactly. Yeah. So you're building a visual, you're building a query in the Rx uh, domain graphically. And actually, it turns out this is actually compiled. So then the way I do this is actually, I didn't talk about this at all, so, but the code is generated. Yeah, so, I think so you're... In some ways, one of the things that does seem to differ conceptually compared to, say, LabVIEW and others is this is totally founded in, in that Rx way of thinking. Yes. You've had a, what is a very clean programmatic yes. textual programming model, yes. which has been quite refined. Yeah. And then you build the visual editing environment, environment for exactly. that. Exactly. Whereas... So it, yeah, so it takes the Rx monad and basically builds a graphical layer to that. Right. And so, um, any questions from the audience before we get? Yeah. What sort of the limitations do you have with this language? In terms of, uh, in terms of expression? Yeah. So, every node you put there is essentially an observable. So, uh, one of these Rx, um, like, or, or an enumerable if you want to think about it. And now what you're going to do is all these nodes are operating on these observables. So they take as inputs any number of observables, and they output one, one other observable. So anything you can express in that, I mean, you can argue what is the general, generality of that, but you can keep extending it to whatever uh, domain you want. So you're not, I mean, it's as general as SQL, uh, I would say. I mean, we can discuss what, what, what is the... But it has general purpose, so it's not tied into any like video processing or audio processing or whatever. So, so I guess I guess this is a related question. So if you're you know, you've got the static data flow graph, right? So what if you want the structure of the graph to change? Yeah, dynamically, you know, right? Dynamically, then yeah, yeah. yeah. With that? So, that, so that's the the most in, in, interesting step in this. So the the way the code is generated, I didn't talk about this at all. But um, when you're putting in these nodes here, you're actually more technically, you're actually um, you're defining a build graph. So the, this is actually going to do code generation. And actually, you have control over that. So you can, for each of these nodes, I can actually ignore, you can write models. This will take me more time to explain. But you can actually take, you can take control over the build and essentially do whatever you want. And specifically, the, and what scenario that I um, find particularly interesting for future applications is it doesn't, the code doesn't even need to be technically run in C-sharp. So I could use um, the cube servable. I don't know if you know this um, interfaces like, like Link. You can run queries actually in the database. You can do things here as well. So I could take control over the build and, for example, run code embedded in the Arduino, for example. Yeah, I can pu push bits of code out to devices and things like that because I have the build graph in my in my hand, and you could have nodes that dynamically do things like that. So uh, I saw you had a an, a node that would allow you to write Python scripts. Yeah. But you have .NET underneath. Yeah. So can I write? Can I have a sharp and stuff? C sharp. F sharp. F sharp. Oh, of course. I mean, of course. I actually I I was waiting for a while. I actually uh, had to make it this. I, I, toyed with the idea of, should I put F-sharp scripting or, um, or Python scripting? Uh, both, probably, yeah. But uh, F-sharp is, um, I couldn't find at the time, this was like three years ago when I was making these initial decisions, I couldn't find a good um, interpreter for F-sharp that would work hosted inside the, an application. I don't know if this has changed, That's probably. Yeah. 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 Kind of graphical data flow systems, uh, there's a bit of a trend. Um, if you look at Azure ML, for example, as a graphical editing environment for data flow, have you looked at that at all? Azure, Azure, ML. Machine, yeah, Azure machine learning, not yet. web toolkit, no. and so on. Uh, there's, there's quite a tendency to, to move to use data frames, uh, 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 so the time series data frames, uh, are as the intermediate sort of format that gets passed mm -hmm. along. They could be incremental ones or so on. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, whereas I, you, know, you see at the end that some of your things output a tuple of things, yeah. for example. And I just wondered if that has come up on your radar, that you know, using, using, using data frames uh, in the R sense of that could be, it, it or, could be, or the pandas. Yeah, these, these kinds of intermediate representations that you build within the language, that there, there's rooms to be, that's an important 
instead of instead of using items, you're using observables everywhere. Yeah, exactly. A system like Azure ML uses data frames. Everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just wonder if how you think. I mean, about technically, technically, I, well, well, no. The answer is not yet. But one extension that I, I thought it would be easy to do is just tying this because now it's observables anywhere, but could as easily be enumerables anywhere or any um, combination of, of both of them or even other things because, but, um, but the data frames I haven't, I haven't looked at yet, but. Uh, cool, well, that was a nice we'll probably finish up there and yeah. um, Charles and Adam are around this afternoon. We've got yeah. another five guys would like to take the next half hour if anybody else would like to have a chat. But, uh, You've got time for your purple paper that you're working on. <laughs> anyway, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs>